So on my reality show, there's a, actually this guy's a genius, but you wouldn't, couldn't tell by the way he pitched and what he pitched his business. So he was building and his product is patent protected. It's basically an AI powered financial assistant. But the way he pitched, you'd think it's something completely different. When we were pitching to be part of the show in December, his product was private beta, invite only to test it. Fast forward a year later, when we had the premiere for our show last month, I said, have you launched it? He's like, no, we're still testing things. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? You're gonna be on a TV show and get all this publicity and you're still testing what? He's like, no, I need to raise money to finish development. I'm like, you're the technical guy. That's the one thing you don't need help with. Because he's too smart for his own good. He keeps building, building, but he's not launching. He's building in an echo chamber. So you have to build fast. Marketing and product development go hand in hand. You build something, you launch. Get some feedback, you launch. And you keep pivot, and you will be making those pivots. That's why there's nothing wrong with listening. You have to listen to the user. If you look at Pinterest's story, how they got, before Pinterest became Pinterest, there was a lot of trial and error. Sorry, apologies for that. So never ever, let's say don't work in an echo chamber, but never build in an echo chamber as well. So, but so now here's a problem though, right? Is when you're building something, you don't you need to build something to test the market. So what you, what I would advise doing is everyone's familiar with a SWOT analysis. All right, do a SWOT analysis. Okay, because it gives you your initial market research on whatever product it could be anything. It doesn't have to always be a tech product. It could be any kind of product or service. Look, your SWOT analysis will also become your future business plan. And that future business plan will become the foundation of your deck. And that SWOT analysis will allow you to do your initial market research to build whatever product service you're launching. Another classic mistake, are you guys familiar with the term MVP? Or what is an MVP for you guys, to you guys? Most valuable player. I meant in the startup world. Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> minimum viable product. Oh. But hey, your, min your MVP could be your MVP. That's fine. So, what for to you guys, and even that, what to you is a minimum viable product? Something that doesn't require a lot of cost or time to work on? Close enough. Minimum viable product is what you think you need to launch. So, you got a, let's say you've got a tech team, you've got some funding, and, you know, let's just to make it simple, you're launching a concierge app that lets you book any service you need on the app. Okay? Very simple. You need to go out there quickly, test this idea before you squander lots of money, right? Like I know a startup that squandered $4 million building a product that was good, but they could have just spent a quarter million, built the first phase of that product, got into revenue and traction, and then kept going. So most people, with an MVP, you're not build, you're building what you think based on your initial SWOT analysis, what this product needs. So for example, if I'm building a concierge app, okay, this product should have the ability for users to find chores or items they need and they can book it through the app. And I need to make sure that I have a bunch of suppliers listed, that's it. Yeah, I wanna do AR and VR, great, that's a nice to have. When building any new service or product, you have to differentiate between the must have and nice have. So your MVP initially, your initial products are all what you think are must have products. Let's say they're, I always say pick a number five, they're top five must haves. Then you'll launch that product, you'll market it, and then you'll have what I call the Mike Tyson rule. Everyone's got a plan till they get punched in the face. So be prepared for the market to punch you in the face. It's okay, you'll get punched in the face, you'll learn, okay, why you got punched in the face, and then you tweak again. You make those tweaks to the app, or your product, or your service, launch again. And through this trial and error process, you'll eventually reach what we call critical mass, and that's when the startups begin to take off. And that's what I mean by it's a very long journey. You have to be very patient, you gotta persevere, you don't give up, but you have to listen. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. No, no, you're in the, uh, uh, I was wondering, um, I don't know, you said trial and error. I was wondering, so you said entrepreneurs are, they have to believe in what they're pursuing. Mm -hmm. Now, of they course, believe in themselves. and believe in themselves. So the company, let's say, uh, let's say I want to start a company, 
and if I if I truly believe in this company, do you think it's smart for the uh, the person to get like let's say trademarks on that company or like a copyright on that company right off the bat, or would you say to right wait on it right off the bat? Right. Biggest thing so, you're, so you, how do you have to protect your entity? So if you don't have your trademark, which is actually perfect, we're going to my next thing. It's another classic mistake entrepreneurs make: legality. So you're building something, there's a brand. Even if it doesn't have what we call intellectual property, there's trademark to it, your logo, your website, right? Your business name. So if you don't trademark it, how do you protect your brand? And trademarking doesn't cost, like, cost you like, I think like a couple hundred dollars. You pay a lawyer, it'll cost you about a few hundred dollars, or you can do it yourself and pay like a 200 bucks. So it's a cost, but it's not an impossible cost. It's just some, it's, it's a necessary evil. Definitely you have to do that because if you ask me to invest in your business and I'm investing, you haven't even protected your intellectual property. Like, cause you're marketing, you're selling your product. So there's value in that logo, in that name. But if it's not a trademark, how are you protecting it? And if anything, and we actually made this mistake, Gift Genie, we thought it'd be a great name. We actually picked a very tough name to enforce by a trademark. Because when we initially launched it in Canada, no problem. But now that we're also a U.S. entity, <laughs> I'm going to have to spend a lot of money on potential lawsuits or debate changing my name. Because three years ago, we thought Gift Genie is a great name from a marketing branding point of view, but we didn't take into fact trademark and legality. So this is a classic mistake entrepreneurs make is, we do, is that because legal costs are expensive, it's not something that's going to give you a return compared to you know spending on marketing or spending on tech development. We push it off. Unfortunately, there's no way to plot around it. Spend the money on these things. It's a, it's, a, it's a fixed cost. Spending it now helps you down the road as well. And I'll tell you one other thing why it helps you. Another classic mistake entrepreneurs make. So let's say you've built the product, you've got some market traction, you've got what we call product and market fit. Now you need to get in front of investors to raise money. I always say, don't chase investors, chase milestones. What is the next milestone you need to hit with your business? Can you hit it on your own? Once you hit that milestone, then you approach an investor to help you get to the next milestone, and that's where you go. So, classic mistake entrepreneurs make when they get in front of an investor. Can anyone guess? They're talking about like their five-year plan. No, they just don't know their own valuation. You know, hey, investor Vic, I'm looking to raise half a million. What's your valuation? So either they don't have a valuation, or they have a ridiculous number like five, 10 million. So the good news is, as long as there's intelligence, and, and this is not something you need to just Google this, valuing pre-revenue or early stage startups, there's a lot out there. There's a formula that most VCs use. They look at the market potential, the current traction, user base. They're, they're gonna be prepared to be beat up on the valuation, it's okay. As long as there's intelligence behind your valuation, you're okay. But be, but have a number, right? We're looking to raise 500,000 at a valuation of 2 million. And if they say, do you have a term sheet? Always say yes. I made this mistake. It was, uh, we started Gift Genie. Uh, I pitched this investor, he's actually fully interested, except, uh, and I had my valuation, everything ready, but I made one rookie mistake. He's like, Vic, send me your term sheet. It took me two weeks to set up the term sheet because I didn't have one. Have all the, before you get, because when you don't have that in place, you're telling an investor you're not ready. You're not ready for their investment. So one of our advisors, uh, he made this rookie mistake a few years ago. I won't say his name and his company, but very successful company, just exited for 50 million. When they first launched, uh, they got lucky. They, got, they had an early stage VC interested. And this VC cut them a che- was willing to give them a check of 600,000, which would have taken their company to the next level. So they, now a lot of VCs, when they give you a term sheet, it's like a 24-hour, 48-hour time limit. You have to review and accept. So they sent him the uh, term sheet. These guys gave it to their lawyer. And the lawyer came back like 24 hours later saying, here are, you know, these terms aren't very good, blah, 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 I'm not sure. So then they sent that document back to the investor with some of these suggestions, and they lost the deal. Guess what? It took too long to review and return. Yeah, investors like you guys aren't ready. You should. You made a rookie. If you had concern, should have jumped on a call within the first hour. 
to go over them, not wait 24 hours. Number two, lawyers are, a lawyer's job is to protect your ass and their own, but their ass before. There were certain, so certain things that they were saying, it was the lawyer covering his butt, but they didn't really, it wasn't that important to them. But they wasted time because they just trusted their lawyer because they'd never done this before. They ended up, they lost out. And it took them 18 months before they closed their next big route. So it was almost a big setback. So over the 18 months, a lot of them took part-time jobs to keep funding their venture, but they believed they'd originally stuck it up. But that's a classic example of and it's funny, it's almost funny because every entrepreneur I know, and I've first experienced it, we've all basically bungled our first VC pitch. <laughs> it's almost like the universe, you, it's, the universe will, it won't make it that easy. Right so you, you think you're about to close, like I thought to him, like, hey, this guy, I'm gonna get a quarter million and boom, I'm ready to go. This guy, this is like, he's like an Indian Mark Cuban. So getting this guy on my term, she's gonna be great. Same thing, he bungled it up, he was interested in everything, and I do diligence. It's almost like the universe says that we can't make it that easy. No. And then after that, it took me a year to close my next investor. But now here's something interesting, and you guys will follow it, because the stage you guys are at will probably be, you put some of your own money in, maybe get some friends and family, and you'll probably look at getting an angel investor, and then potentially an institutional investor. There's a lot of paths you have to take before you are ready for an institutional investor. So the key thing you gotta remember is most entrepreneurs make two classic mistakes here. They give up too little or they give up too much. And there's signs, because this space, here's a thing, and that includes me. Imagine we're all sheep, or imagine we're little fish, and there are a lot of bigger predators out there that are gonna gobble us up. But, so how do you, but you'll evolve. From that fish, you might become a school of piranha. Then eventually you guys might become killer whales, but the sharks are scared of you. But it's an evolution, so you, have to, you have to stick together. So, this is a lesson I learned again, the hard way, is that you're gonna get a lot of sharks, and people wanna take advantage because they know you're vulnerable. So, I'll give you an example. We closed our first 100,000 with that incubator I told you about, and then six months later, we closed our second 100,000. And this investors knew me for a couple of years. And it was really funny. I actually had lunch with them in the summer. And we were talking, he's like, Vic, you're so excited to give him an update on where we are. And he's like, it's so funny, Vic. You're so, you never once asked me why I invested. I'm like, you're right. He's like, yeah, I guess you're so excited about the money. You never thought. I'm like, it's true. I'm like, why did you? He's like, now when we exit, I'll give you that answer. But then he told me something interesting. He came in at a valuation of 1.5 million for 100 kids. He's got about six and change of our company. He's like, my lawyer was actually telling me to come in at 1 million and own 10%, but I didn't haggle too much. And I said, how come? He's like, listen, uh, you were the largest individual investment I made at any company at that point. And he's a pretty relatively successful guy. So he's just like, if I lose my money, it's okay because that was the amount I'm willing to lose. I wouldn't have put it in 150K. 100K was my threshold I'm willing to lose. So if I make my money back, great. If I make you know, two times, 10 times, I'm happy. But if we're successful and we have that exit, me owning 6% or 10% is not gonna make that much of a difference as long as we have a successful exit. But you need to raise more money and every percentage, and you're gonna get beat up a lot by the, all these investors. So you need every percentage point you can hang on to. That's the kind of investor you want early stage. Because he's in for the long haul. You're gonna get a lot of sharks who are like, are gonna give you a, we're gonna want 50% of your company. If any rule, if any investor, including a VC, wants more than 30% of your company, unless it's Facebook or in your case, clothing company, so Neiman Marcus wants to take over distributorship, there are exceptions, you're right. Because they're sharks. They basically want to destroy your idea or take it for a different, because as I said, most investors, we're not investing in the idea, we're investing in the team. So if someone wants to take 30% of your company, you're realistically gonna be less than 50% at a very early stage. Now by the time you do a series B, so friends and family, seed, angel, sorry, angel, seed, series A, which is usually when you have revenue and traction, where you want, where you're trying to raise anywhere between five to 10 million. By and then after that, Series B is when you want to keep growing. So by the time you hit a Series A or B round where you're looking to raise anywhere between five upwards of 50 million, you'll probably eventually become a minority in your company. But that's okay, because at that point, the pie is really big. 
before you hit that stage, if anyone wants 30% of, more than 30% of their company, run. Because that means they don't believe in you. They just maybe like your idea, or maybe they like the IP, but they're not believing in you. Because think about it, it's so early on in your venture, you don't have 50% of your own company, won't you lose motivation? Then just an employee. So if the, an investor, if he's not investing in you, why is he investing in your business? There's some other similar business economics. Always keep that in mind with the investors. There's, I can't tell you how many sharks there are out. And unfortunately, some of you're gonna learn the hard way, or you've got to make sure you're surrounded by some really smart advisors who've kind of been there through this, so they kind of advise you, which comes into my next one. I talked about building co-founders in a team. Advisors are very critical to the startup. Now, when I mean advisors, I don't mean fancy names that look great on paper, but they're not. Like, for example, I know someone who's got some really, who's got someone who is head of Amazon Canada as their board member. Looks great on paper, that guy doesn't do anything. <laughs> Literally nothing. Like, this pen is more useful than a moron. <laughs> but he thought, hey, it's a fancy name. I got the CEO of Amazon on my board. And like, and he's actually, it's another gifting app that allows you to send gifts by SMS. So that would be a great partnership for Amazon. So if you're a board member, why the hell are you not facilitating that? Mm -hmm. So what you'll find is you're gonna get what I call these board vulture hawks. What these guys like doing is they'll select to become board members on 20, 30 different companies. It's almost like a lobby. Hey, I'm gonna get a couple of percent here, a couple of percent here. I am not gonna do anything to contribute, but if one of them hit, it's like the lottery. Mm -hmm. I, this happened to me, I had this gentleman, he won't say his name, but if you go on LinkedIn, successful investor, entrepreneur, all the whole works. And he said, I would love to be an advisor on Gift Genie. So we went back and forth and I made, I remember, making him an offer, I think, of 1.5 or 2%, which is actually high. So the general rule is anywhere between 0 0.25 to 2%. Never more than that. Because if they want more than 2%, they're, they're not a board advisor, then they're looking to be a co-founder. Because between 5 to 10% is usually what you give to be a co-founder. Like most funds, if you've got at least 10% in the company, you're generally considered a co-founder. So, <clears throat> so when I gave him that offer, he's like, Vic, I'm a little insulted. He's like, I was expecting at least, you know, four or five percent. I'm like, uh, let's just say his name's Jay. I'm like, Jay, but uh, why? He's like, I'm like, okay, but Jake, I, can you invest money? He's like, at this point, I'm not liquid. Okay, so he's not putting money. Uh, okay, can you help with investor intros at least? Because we're actively fundraising. He's like, I can, but I don't want that to be my defining role. I'm like, okay, so what can you help with? He's like, I can help you put together a board. I'm like, I don't need you, okay? That's fine, I'll get you all the fancy name. I'll get you so-and-so on the board. I'm like, okay. And I'll help you with strategic partnerships. Like, I'll help you get to revenue. I'm like, okay. Here's the thing. If an advisor, advisor does two things. Either he's doing a role that you don't have a co-founder or you can't afford to pay someone to do that. An advisor fills that role. Like, I have a blockchain advisor because I can't afford a blockchain CTO who's doing my blockchain architecture. He's an advisor. I have another advisor who's helping us with our digital media strategy and who's actively making investor intros. If your advisor aren't doing any of these tough things, they're not advisors. Mm -hmm. So when you're building your team of co-founders and advisors, don't necessarily go after the fancy name. Like who wouldn't want the head of Amazon or the head of Google on your board? It looks great, but what if you've got someone who's just some director with Amazon or just a top engineer product guy with Google? Those guys still have a powerful title, but they'll actually work and deliver. The, the point I'm trying to make is, when you're going after board members, don't look at the fancy names and the title, see if someone will hustle and actually deliver you results. So, this is my advisor who's my, uh, and this is another test. Mo all the advisors I have uh, I've built on the past few years, they all were basically working for free for at least a year before I made them advisors. And example, so one of our advisors who's helping us with corporate finance, I met him last summer, and within the first five minutes of the meeting, he introduced me to an investor who I'm still talking to, and he introduced me to a company out of Philadelphia that could be a company that might acquire us down the road. Five minutes without asking for anything. Over the course of the year, whenever I needed some advice, guidance, he was always available. We finally made him an advisor in the summer. Another one of our advisors, the person who I said who was a digital media, who's had those two exits and who bungled his first 600K, 
when I made him an, uh, an advisor, he's like, I was offering him half a percent of Gift Genie. He wanted a quarter. He's like, no, you need your equity. I'm here to help. I want less. And because he wanted less, I made sure I gave him the full half. Mm -hmm. So our blockchain guy, he's been an advisor for the past year. The document's been sitting. He's never signed it. He finally signed it last week because we're in due diligence with an investor and we want to make sure the team's formalized. So what I'm trying to say is people like that are out there. It takes time to build that. But these are the kind of people you want to build your team with. Not those guys that want to just be at it. Sorry, you had a question. How do you find such people? You put yourself out there. You, you have to be like, you know, forums, networking, right? I mean, either you have that network or you have someone on your team who has that network or you're like, be active, right? Like, go to these entrepreneurial forums, these networking events. There's, I was at an event last night at uh, the Alley where they were talking about how to build an engineering team. And one of my friends with me, he was actively looking for a co founder. And there are people there looking for stuff. So, you have to, do not build your startup in a vacuum. You have, that's what I mean, you, I literally cannot say that, I always say it's the art of hustle and putting yourself out there. Lightning will strike, but you have to go outside. Sorry, I think someone else had their hand up. Anyway, so in closing, uh, I covered advisors, I covered, Oh, another investor, funny story. So I had another investor who reached out to me. This happened in July. And again, this guy's a complete crook. <laughs> Actually, I'm gonna tell you this guy's name because if ever you guys meet this guy, Rod, his name is Raj Pamnani. So this gentleman, <laughs> and I, it's, the reason why, because this guy is a complete crook, so this guy, someone must afford him my deck, reached out to me, and hey, you know, I'm so-and-so, I'm an investor, I like what you're doing, uh, can you send me some further information? So I sent him my information, he's like, I'm interested, I'm an investor, let's meet. So I was, I met him in New York, great meeting, asked me what my valuation is, and then he's like, okay, you know what, how much are you looking to raise? I said, we're looking to raise about a million, million and a half. He's like, okay, I'm willing to put 200,000. So we had this over like two meetings. I'm gonna put 200,000, but I want 10% of your company, and then I'm gonna help you raise an additional million. But we, need, but my investors are in India and China, so we're gonna to have to make a trip there. I'm like, okay. Uh, but he's like, I will put 200K first, and then I'll help you raise the money. He's like, okay, perfect. Then he's like, well, but we're gonna to have to make a trip. I said, listen, for me, to fly down to China, that's expensive, hotels, everything. So he's like, yeah, the problem is you're gonna to have to go there. I said, well, I'd rather than focus on India, because I. From India, I have a family, I have a home there, so if I have to max out my credit card, at least in India, I have a home to stay, it's a little bit easier. He's like, okay, he's like, and he's like, okay, uh, but there's gonna be a fee involved for me. I'm like, okay, what fee? He's like, well, you're a young guy, but I've got a little back problem, so I need to fly first class, so my total fee will be $10,000. So I'm like, but aren't you investing 200K? So if you're gonna invest 200K, you really wanna take the 10K back <laughs> He said, no, no, my 200K is conditional. This you'll have to pay up front. And I'm like, well, I'll be honest, to be honest, if you want it, if you help us raise and you want to take a fee, great, but I don't have the funds to do that. He's like, oh, but how about, how are you gonna pay for your trip to India? I'm like, I'll scrap the credit card and I have, I'll live with friends. He's like, yeah, but these investors, I mean, we're gonna have to network with them. There's expensive lunches and dinners. I'm like, long story short, this fool wanted me to pay for his trip to India, pay for his five-star hotel and all his candlelight dinners and then they'd be like, oh, sorry, they, I got you the meetings, but they're not interested. <laughs> and we're laughing, but now I wasn't desperate, so I didn't fall for it. But what if this guy approached you guys and said, I'll do it for a thousand or two thousand? Would you not be tempted if you're really desperate? Watch out for these guys. Never pay to play. Never. There's, I'm saying in Koretsu Forum, they charge 5,000 and you pitch to their investors. Don't do it. There's a way to get in front of investors without having to pay. I mean, there are exceptions. Like, you want to pay like 30 bucks or 100 bucks at a specific pitch event to pay? That's different. But, and there are a couple of forums where it's a membership fee of like $100 a month over a year. There are exceptions. But overall, if someone wants a couple of thousand for you to pitch, do not. It's not worth it. This, that money can be better used to pay your social media person, pay for your developer, just pay yourself. But we entrepreneurs, because we get this desperate, we want to get in front of the investors, and we fall for that trap. Most investors will find you if you're doing something good or you're doing something innovative. 
I said, focus on milestones and the challenges of your business. So if you're an app, okay, how do you get 10,000 or 100,000 people using your product? If you get to that, trust me, there'll be people lining up to invest. In you. If you're in the clothing business, get a, get Macy's or Nordstrom be carrying your line. You think you're gonna have trouble finding an investor? Even the bank will lend you money at that point. Mm -hmm. Point is, as on, we, as the one thing you have to do, the difference between the entrepreneur and the corporate world, in the corporate world you think money will solve the problem you have the resources. In startups, you don't have the resources. You have to find a way to solve problems without money. Technically, we ran out of money last, about two months ago. And my developers are working for free. I, at least for now, I hope I don't jinx it. Why? Because they're in this, because they believe in the vision or on IOUs, whatever. The point is through promise, IOUs, equity, you know, my left arm, whatever I can offer them, they're keep on going. And that's what you have to do, it's just through your hustle. But they're in this because they believe in the vision. If you can't convince anyone on your team to believe in your vision, no one else is gonna believe in it. So, on, in closing, uh, I'm a big uh, martial artist, so I like the samurai comparison, but the strongest swords, I don't know if you guys know anything about swordsmith. <laughs> so basically, when these uh, blacksmiths create swords or craft swords, the strongest sword of craft are literally these furnaces that are like boiling room temp, like it's so strong it can melt a home. But the strongest stores are crafted in the strongest flame. And that's when how diamonds are formed. So it's a tough path, but through this fire, you'll emerge stronger as long as you don't quit. And don't stop listening. Your advisors, your friends, you have to surround, you have to you have the ability to surround yourself with well-wishers. It's not easy, it comes from experience where you know who's a genuine well-wisher and who's not. But you surround yourself with that ecosystem, you'll be very successful. I think that's applicable to pretty much anything. It is, it is. Um, thank you so much. I think that these were great words of wisdom. I think everybody needed to hear, to, despite what your path is, whether you're an entrepreneur or you wanna go just do entrepreneurial things for another company. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Now, I probably went on longer than I thought, so I think we've got a good 15 minutes, so just rapid fire, and I'll leave you guys my email after this, you can, listen, I'm here to help. I believe in something called entrepreneur karma. <laughs> help each other out. So, I will uh, just, actually, just get my email from Marlene and Lauren, and just anytime email me. If I can help with something, I will help. Now, don't bombard me with, say, investor intros. I plan to <laughs> because, But if you genuinely need help, and if you reach your point with your business, I will do my part to help you get to the next level. That's, I'm here to help because I do this because when I started off in this space 10 years ago, no one wanted to help. So I kind of made a mission that when I'm in this position, because it's actually, I was actually, I'm ranting it. I was at a really cool event in Philly and again in the summer. Uh, many of you guys know Gene Simmons? Mm -hmm. Some kiss. Uh, some of you guys are younger, so me or me not. So here's an interesting, he's almost <laughs> like the George Lucas of music. So do you guys know how Star Wars became so successful? or how George Lucas made his first billion. Mm -hmm. So, everyone's obviously heard of Star Wars. Uh, 20th Century Fox, you know, as a director, you get paid a fee of a million. George Lucas said, and at that point, no one thought this would be successful. So George Lucas said, I'll waive my fee, but in exchange, I want a percentage of the merchandise. And Fox like, oh, this is great. We just saved a million. Who the hell's gonna watch Cypress in 1979? <laughs> Let's just say that merchandising was sold billions, and that allowed George Lucas to basically fund Empire Strikes Back. Mm. The value was in the merchandising. So Gene Simmons from KISS, the same thing. If anyone read comics in the 60s or 70s, you'll see these old pull-out ads of these KISS action figures, KISS gloves, because these guys were like merchandising. So in the music industry, people mocked Gene Simmons because you're, you're, you're not a purist, you're branding, but he realized the value of branding and merchandising, and their merchandise outsells almost anything, even to this day. Now, I was at the VIP when he He said something interesting. I didn't realize what an entrepreneur he was. Like, I didn't notice that ACDC, uh, Nirvana, Iron Maiden, all got their big break through KISS. So all of their first, ACDC's first North American tour, KISS arranged it. And he said something really interesting, Gene Simmons. He's like, when you're climbing up that mountain, you always stick your hand up for the guy beneath you. So all of you, including myself, we're all at different stages. None of us have reached the top of the mountain. You know, some of us might be 10% there, 20%, 30%. You still got a long mountain to climb, but there's always someone above you, and 
there's always someone beneath you. And you don't kick the guy beneath you, you stick your hand out and help him up. Do that as entrepreneurs. Because you it's amazing how you'll find when you start doing that, good things will your challenges, some will come and help you with one of your challenges. And so for that, I'm happy to help in any capacity. That's awesome. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a question before I Jump in. You, look like you, always you don't have a question? Damn it, man. I'm disappointed almost. Uh, um, Go for it. I know uh, you've probably said this before. So do you recommend you, do you recommend going for investors maybe like a month or two after you start up? Or would you say like, do you think it's up to, do you think starting right away, uh, chasing after investors is a smart thing? Or should you? There's two schools of thought. Uh, technically, there's no timelines. You need to get it from an investor when you have something to show. Okay. Right? And more importantly, something that's going to interest them, right? Hey, I've got an app. Okay. How many users? Zero. How much revenue? Zero. Why the hell are you wasting my time? Yeah. So two schools thought it was an investor's like, and that's why I call it, emphasize splitting your business in one line. Google this called a Y Combinator 30 second and two minute pitch. Make that your Bible. Because whether you're meeting someone at an event or even at a pitch contest, you usually have two to three minutes to pitch. You gotta get all your key points in two minutes to get their attention. My personal advice, I mean, once you've got something tangible, like a tangible product with some market traction, that's when you start actively getting in front of investors because technically you don't wanna burn the bridge. Now, if you happen to meet an investor at a random event and he's like, oh, so what are you doing? This is what he's like, oh, that's really interesting. And he's like, let's say, and let's say he says, are you looking for fundraising? But you can say, no, we're not looking for fundraising right now, but I'd like to exchange your content and be in touch in three to four months, that's okay. But until you have something to show, you're wasting your time and your investor's time. And it'll be and it's harder, unless someone's able to open those doors for you. So one is you don't wanna waste that favor, getting in front of an investor when you're not ready. And more importantly, you wanna burn that bridge. And when you don't have those contacts, you're basically hustling, networking. So the best way to meet investors is actually pitch events. If you've got an active business, you should be pitching every day. I still do that. Every day, I'm at some networking event in between time. That's how I built 50% of my advisory board and my team. 50% came through my prior startup experience, 50% through that. So when you go to these pitch events, that's where, you, that's where I've built all my investor contacts. Because I'm pitching and they, someone approaches you, oh, I'm interested in. That's the best way. All these funds, so let's say you have to remember, you have to know what space you're in. You have to know which in investors, what space they're investing in, right? Don't approach a guy who invests in AI with a clothing line, right? Okay. And you're not gonna pitch a you know, B2B blockchain platform to someone who's interested in retail, right? You have to know your audience. Do your homework on who invests in your space and what state, and all that information is available online. And a little trick that I do, every investor or fund that I believe is a fit for what I'm doing, I've signed up for their mailing list. I get a lot of spam, but those, all these funds and accelerators have weekly, if not monthly, events. And then by attending them, one is they see visibility because you're always there. And I, now like half of these events, you always, the VCs already know me because like I'm always at their events. But that's how you build an organic, genuine relationship. Because you can never have someone who can open all the doors for you. So this is some, this is its own way of growth hacking you have to do. And I'll give you another growth hacking technique. There's a lot of investor events in New York. I'm sure you guys have seen there's like an instrumental cost of anywhere between sometimes 500 up to a couple of thousand. Here's a secret. You never pay for those events. Walk in like you just, you already there. <laughs> so most of these events at these conference centers, uh, they're all, either you show up two, three hours late where they're not checking registration and nine out of 10 of these events, with the exception of one where I got, almost got caught, are at hotels. When you walk in, there's an exit, there's a, usually there's the, either on the left or the right, there's someone doing registration. Whatever side they're registering, you go the other side, because there's always two entrances. <laughs> and just go and pretend like you're mingling with the crowd. Another time I remember this was an event, it was like, and I met an investor because of this. It was a blockchain event in New York, and again, it's a $2,000 fee. I wasn't gonna pay that, and I got there, I'm like, okay, there's only one entrance, because you have to go up the elevator. I'm like, I can't sneak in. So I'm like, okay, I went to a Starbucks, made some calls, waited two hours, come back, damn it, they're still checking. <laughs> an hour later, they're still checking. How do I do this? So I knew one of the P, the panelists, not very well. So I just walked them all, shuffled and ruffled like I'm just stressed. I'm like, oh, I just got in, yeah, yeah, my flight was late, blah, blah, just making this up. And I'm like, oh, how's it going? I'm like, hi, my name is Vikram Chopra. Um, he's like, oh, uh, 
uh, who's I can't see the list whose name right I'm like oh Bill Davis that's one of the panelists I'm like honestly I just got in today morning I was a last minute addition Bill must put me in last like, no problem go ahead <laughs> and here's the fun now here's the real click now that event had a VIP dinner at a completely different venue where it's more intimate where I want and there's a couple of investors I really want because it's just a big event how am I gonna really network so I found out from someone where it's happening. So this conference ended at 6, 6.30, started at nine, and I think this VIP event started at 7.30 at some Mexican restaurant just a block away. I got the name, event ended at six, I rushed to that restaurant, because it's the official time, 7.30. Rest of the event, I'm like, oh, I'm here for this event. They're like, oh, you're here early, just go down to the basement. So I got there before no anyone was setting up, so I bypassed them checking who's coming in. So I got a nice free meal, lots of free drinks, and I made some really good contact. The point is, you'll, is you have to find a way. I'll do another funny hack I did for my college days. So as you can see, chicken scratch, I have like horrible writing. So in college, my, I always joke, I probably got one less mark because of my horrible handwriting. So I thought I'll be creative. So one time I went to the college professor, he's like, Vic, I can't read your hand, it's horrible. I said, okay, professor, here's a problem. I used to do a lot of martial arts, and during I did my black belt test when I was 18, I was supposed to strike a target, and I hurt my wrist. And because of that, I have a permanent, semi-permanent wrist problem if I can't always write properly. <laughs> Completely making this oh. up. <laughs> it was believable enough. <laughs> Point is, okay, I'm taking this as a joke, but as an entrepreneur, these are kind of growth tags. You're not lying your example. These are the kind of growth tags you're gonna have tactic you'll find to get yourself to the next level. But you find the loophole, you just find a way. Sorry, any more questions? I know I've been going on. And we've got five minutes. Uh, my question is, when was the time that you didn't listen to your gut and you should have? All the time, I mean, that's right. the first thing you have to always listen to your gut. Mm -hmm. uh, we had an investor just last month, we got an offer. Uh, the guy wanted was willing to put in half a million for about 25% of our company. I'm like, okay, not too bad. I can live with it. And my he scared my partner. My partner's like, I'm like, why? We're getting the money, and we still control the majority of the company. They go, this guy scares me. I'm like, but Gerard, what can he do? He's like, Vic, that's just crazy because when we Google this guy and his reputation is a little bit unscrupulous. But I'm like, the money's good. He's like, no. He scares me because I can't even think how he can screw us over. But his gut just screamed. And you know, we could use the money, we said no. So always follow your gut. What will happen is, as you get more seasoned in your business decision, you'll, be, you'll apply more logic and facts. But really, when you're building something new from scratch, there's no data, right? There was no Facebook before Facebook. I mean, there was MySpace ICQ. But the point is, you're building something relatively new, or you're, or you're, bu or you're building a, or launching a product that's already established, but in a completely different manner. So you're always making it up as you go. So really, all you have is your gut instincts, and that's what I said, right? You're gonna make mistakes, your gut's not always gonna be right. It's that ability to keep trying, but listening, right? You're not gonna keep banging your head on a wall, because you're gonna crack your skull, or if you've got a really hard head, you'll crack the wall, but do you really need to do that, or you could've just got on a hammer, or just climbed the wall. That's where you have to be smart. Don't, when I mean don't give up, I don't mean keep banging your head on the wall. <laughs> you know, tunnel underneath it, go around it, can you climb over it? Right? Or just take a car and drive. Like, find a way, but just don't be a moron. Yeah, I think that's a strong, strong priority there. Anybody have another?